Hey guys, Sloppy Joe here. We're going to do a video today. We're going to do an introduction to the Mosin Nagant. For those of you who do not own one and are thinking about buying one, uh, we know ammo is still either short in a short supply or expensive, or um, particular rifles that some of us would really like to get our hands on are either not available or uh, right now, you know, talk about, you know, the gun scare. And then the economy is still kind of in the toilet so some of us might not have five six seven hundred dollars to drop on a fun rifle to go shoot especially one larger than 22 long rifle so I'm going to do an introductory video to the series of Mosin and the Gaunt rifles available to the United States uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why these are so popular and have been popular but are still gaining momentum and popularity uh, with the American shooters so we're going to talk about the rifles themselves, the ammo that's available, cleaning, maintaining them. So we're going to kind of cover a little bit of everything. So let's jump in. All right, guys, so what we've got here are the two most common representatives of the Mosin Nagant. You have what is referred to as either the Model uh, 9130 or M91, which would be your long Mosin. Um, feels like I moved a mile there. So this is your most common variant, 9130, long Mosin. These are the ones that you see in Cabela's, uh, all the big sporting box stores online, all the surplus shops. This is what they're selling. This is the most common gun. So you're going to see these going for anywhere from 120 bucks to 150 bucks and up from there depending on the rarity of the rifle. Um, this particular rifle is a 1934 Tula and not only that it's a marked sniper Tula. Now it was never used as a sniper weapon because the evidence of where the bore holes would be for the scope on either side of the receiver, they're missing. So it was probably built, shot for accuracy, and they said, this is good enough to be a sniper rifle, we'll mark it as that. Now, I don't think it ever made it into a sniper service, it just ended up being a, uh, you know, whatever. But the point is, this weapon, I paid a little bit of a premium for it because it's a Tula, it's a hex receiver, it's marked as a sniper rifle, and it was never used as a sniper rifle. So I paid a whopping $180. So um, even for something that's in the Mosin world a rare or a more rare gun, you're not really getting into the high thresholds of money here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what I just mentioned with the receiver. So this is a Tula factory hex receiver. So if you look at the, the receiver here, you can see it's machined into a hex or a hex shape. So, and then you have, uh, I apologize for the lighting. Um, so right here you can make out the Tula star that is stamped into the top of this receiver here. So you, the Tula factory would be a star with an arrow in the middle. And right here you have stamped into the metal what looks like a C and an N. But they're actually a Cyrillic or Russian S and P. So that was stamped in there. They basically shot it, said this is accurate enough to be a sniper rifle, but it never got, it, it was never used for that. So it's an all numbers matching, all the parts match, all the serial numbers match, everything. It's an original pre-war rifle. And it's just a good clean example. Um, things you want to look out for when you're looking to buy um, any Mosin, um, you know, 
it'd be nice if all the parts fit, matched. If that meant that you know the stock came with the receiver, the receiver and the bolt, everything is stamped and everything matches up. That's great. And even your, you know, the bottom of your magazine, there's a marking right in there for the serial number. Um, ideally, those all match. And ideally, your bore is not shot to smooth bore status. Um, and what I mean by that is the thing has just been shot so much and not really properly maintained. So the salts in the ammo, which we'll get to, uh, the corrosive ammo that a lot of guys fear about owning with these kinds of guns, um, eat away at the metal and it corrodes, etc. And the third thing is they have what they call a counter bore. And what that pertains to is basically you have your rifling that goes down the barrel and at the end of the bore, the crown, it just kind of gets smoothed out. The, the, the rifling just gets smoothed out. So what they would do is they basically would drill back on the bore and just cut it back until they got to good, um, to good rifling on the barrel. So they might have to drill back into here or to here to get to good rifling. For just going to the range and shooting, not a big deal. But if you actually wanted something um, that was going to be fairly accurate, not the most ideal. But again, it's no big deal if you're just going to go out and shoot, you know, shoot at targets. So uh, this is a 34. This is the most common. The, during the war, during the 40s, they made the Ishves factory made millions upon millions, and millions of them. Um, I don't even know if there's official count of how many Mosins were made during the war. The most common you're going to find are Izvesk, and you can tell that if you're looking at the top of the receiver. Uh, I've got my little note here. So the Izvesk symbol is a triangle with an arrow in the middle. Tula would be a star with an arrow in the middle. So the Izvesk triangle, that's the most common, countless numbers of them out there. Um, you know, so again, expect to pay 120 to 150 bucks depending on condition and who the store is and how proud they are of their guns. Um, just inspect it, make sure things are there, make sure things aren't bent and twisted, make sure the wood isn't beat up, things like that. And you really can't go wrong. Um, just for going out and target shooting, they're a lot of fun. Um, ammo, this is your typical 7.62-39 AK round. And this would be your... 762-54R. Uh, this is the longest serving cartridge in military history. Uh, the Russians have been using this since almost the beginning of time. Um, they use this in their light infantry weapons, sniper weapons. To this day, they still use uh, an accurized version of this cartridge for their sniper rounds. Um, and of course, light machine guns, um, things like that. So. It is their powerhouse round. It's been around forever, probably never ever going away. So, as far as power goes, these are probably on par with, say, a 308. Um, I don't think it's going to be at the amount of power as the 30 odd six. And I think if you do a little bit of research, that shows. But as far as um, you know, velocities. Um, power, all that stuff. I think it's around the same as a 308. So it's going to be a six, seven, eight hundred yard cartridge. A thousand might be pushing it, but if you have a, a good set, of, you know, a good optic, and you're a good shooter, and you have a good gun, yeah, it could be a thousand yard cartridge. Um, and the benefit is they're cheap. Uh, most of what we see in America is just um, regular old surplus. Um, just surplus ammunition, steel case, corrosive ammo, um, nothing fancy about it. This is the stuff that they would have just belt fed through machine guns like crazy. It's not super accurate. Um, you can buy new production, uh, brass case, match grade stuff, but you're going to spend a dollar, dollar twenty five a shot. This is, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty cents to twenty five cents a round. Um, I know a tin or a spam can of 440 in today's dollars, 80 bucks or so. I think you can even get that shipped for about 80, 85. So, not break the bank for a high-powered round. Um, the gun in the back. So, this is your other most common Mosin. Uh, this is what they refer to. This is an M44. Uh, the predecessor to this would have been the M38, 
which would not have had this attached bayonet. Now, the Russians have a real, real affinity for bayonets. They love bayonets. So when the M38 came out, which was just a cut-down version of the M, or the, uh, the M91, it didn't have a bayonet, so the Russians still had to you know, affix a bayonet to the front, and they needed this weapon, and they developed it for basically you know, close quarters, in-city, getting around corners and buildings, things like that. They wanted something shorter. Um, so this is what they came up with. But the Russians being Russian, they wanted a bayonet attached to the rifle, something they didn't have to get out of their, you know, get out of the sheath and connect and all that. So they attached this bayonet holder to the barrel, or this bayonet bracket, and it's just a spring loaded. So this is just you would pull back on this, and I, I have this holding up because I can't do it one handed. Um, you would just pull back on this; it would just wrap around and then you would just pull this out and that would be it. So now you've got your bayonet, your your nasty four-sided, you know, Phillips screwdriver looking bayonet um, sticking out. And so you can now basically, if you run out of bullets, not only can you use it as a billy club, but you can also use it as a very large stabbing device. Uh, so, oh, you have to pardon me, I'm going to try to pull this back in without dropping the camera. So you would pull forward on this. And then you would just lock it back in place. So, sorry for that. It's a little hard to do one-handed. Um, anyway, so the M38s are pretty rare. Um, I think with the M38s, you're going to expect to pay 250, 300 bucks, maybe a little higher. Um, M44s, especially if they're wartime M44s, they're going to be a little bit of a premium. This is a 1948 uh, M44, so I know a couple years ago they were going for 200 bucks, 250 bucks. Um, I think they've gone up a little bit, but this rifle is nearly pristine. Um, I got a hold of this rifle from a coworker. And it had not been shot in as long as he's known the rifle. He has known this rifle for 20 years. It's never been shot as far as he knows. And before that, big question mark. But as far as the bluing, the condition of the bore, the condition of the bolt, everything, this rifle's probably got under 500 shots in its life. Um, and I've shot probably, you know, 300 rounds through it. So, uh... I've probably put on two-thirds of the, the, the fired rounds through this thing. And it is, this will kick real hard, um, especially with that short, the shortened bore. It's a big fireball, big boom, and it hurts. Um, so I would def definitely recommend some kind of either a, um, either a padded, uh, something padded on your shoulder or some kind of a rubber butt end that you can attach to these if you're going to shoot, you know, all day long. Um, so again, so this one is what is referred to as a round receiver. You can just see the receivers rounded over. Um, you can see the Ishvet Star, and the you know there's a stamping 1948, um, and that's really about it. A um, couple other things to look out for. You hear guys talk about is sticky bolt, and what that refers to is. After you've fired some rounds, everything's hot, everything's expanded, you start to get to where you've fired a round and you can't get the bolt to open. The bolt won't open. Now, I'm exaggerating that. With this bolt, I can actually just, I can operate it with one or two fingers, maybe, if I can hold it all steady. There, there we go. So, I can operate this all basically with one hand. So, you would... Boom, you would fire, and then some guys, they would have to whack the bolt open. So they'd have to really get in there and just wham, 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 and get it to open. And then then to get it to slide back, they'd have to do the same thing. So that's something you want to test for if you can. This one is a good one. Um, I've never had any issues with this one. So you can see I'm, I'm basically just working it with one hand. Um, this guy's a little bit tougher, but I believe it's because this thing has just not been shot very much at all. Um, this is a very low miles rifle right here. Um, 
and even this one. This one just has not had a hard life. Um, it's original wood to the to the rifle. Everything. It's it's just they've both had a pretty pampered life. I don't think either of them. Uh, I don't think either of them were out the fighting and defending the motherland. So more than likely, you know, you know who knows. Sat in a, a couple arsenals in Russia somewhere, and uh, at some point they made their way over to the U.S. So that's basically. It with the rifles. I mean, the sights, they're rudimentary. If you know AKs, they're pretty much the same. You just got your you got your globe here, your forward post, and then your rear leaf sight. Um, and that's basically it as far as for what the rifles are. Uh, again, with your typical, common, everyday uh, 9130s, you're going to, you know, 150 bucks will buy you a good rifle. Now, I should note it, or note, be weary of uh, sniper rifles. Um, it is very common these days to see some of these stores, um, you know, take your pick. And what they'll advertise and sell is a, you know, a PU, which would have been um, the style of scope that would have been mounted. A PU sniper rifle. Now what happens is a lot of times there's a bunch of these scopes laying around in surplus and what they do is they basically just attach them to a regular run-of-the-mill Mosin that's probably even shot out or ha mostly shot out. And then what they'll do is they'll take an electric pencil and they'll basically just stencil in serial numbers onto uh, the receiver and onto the scope and say, okay, these are a matching pair. And they get you know sold as a sniper rifle and guys shoot them and they just shoot for crap. And that's because... It was never meant to be a sniper rifle. It's probably already had most of its life shot out of it. And now you're just putting a surplus scope on it, um, which may or may not be good. So, and, and guys will sell those things for five, six hundred bucks. Um, a genuine sniper setup, you're going to spend eight hundred to a thousand dollars. Um, so if you're getting a deal that's too good to be true, it probably is. So just be careful of that. I know if I wanted to buy a proper PE scope, which is what the pre-war scope was for this particular rifle, uh, I'm going to spend two or three thousand dollars on the scope if I can find one. So, if I were to stumble across, you know, a scope for two hundred bucks, I know it's probably a cheap copy. Um, so, be wary of that. Yes, the sniper rifles are cool and all that, but the majority of them out there are fakes or they're basically just a Frankenstein. Um, you'll know a real one because a lot of guys can prove it's real either by documentation or from where they got the rifle or the markings on the pair. Um, if you just see that kind of chintzy electric pencil engraving, chances are it's not the real deal. So that all being said, um, we'll cut this here. If you have any questions, Feel free, and I'm going to kick it over, and we're going to talk a little bit about accuracy uh, and cleaning. So we'll get into it. Okay, guys, so let's talk a little bit about accuracy. So uh, disregard these. This is all stuff with my AK. Um, so let's talk uh, Mosin accuracy. So I've got some three-round groups here. The first one is, this is a shot with Wolf Gold, which is a new production, supposed to be match grade. Um, here's a three-shot group that is junk. It is just bad. Um, now, granted, I'm trying to. I was trying to work out the sight. I was, I was trying to adjust the front sight for windage. Um, so I actually it was shooting left, and then I adjusted it and it started shooting right. So I was playing with it a little bit, and you can see I eventually was getting some nice little groups. So you'll see where I've marked RMS, and that's Russian Milserp. Um, Wolf Gold, again, new production, supposed to be match grade, not great. So this rifle with the match grade stuff, I and mean, this is the three-shot group. That's, it's huge. Um, I won't even bother measuring it for you. Um, some of these other ones, let me get my trusty tape measure. So once I, you know, basically tinkered around with the gun, I've, you know, got to know it a little bit, re-familiarized myself with the trigger, because the triggers are a little heavy, um, you know, here's a group, this, and granted, this is 100 yards, open sights, sunny day, probably 85, 90 degrees, um, 
you know, there's a three shot group at probably three and seven eighths. Um, this one is five and an eighth. This one is right around three. Here's one. This, and I remember this group. This one, um, this one really started to string on me. I remember it was shot number one, number two, number three, and the barrel was warm. So it started to string on me from left to right, and that became kind of a trend. So that's about seven and a half. So once I'd kind of felt like I had the rifle dialed in, um, then we started shooting closer to this. Started shooting some, you know, three and five round groups. So yeah, again, I tried. I didn't want to give up on this wolf gold stuff, but so here's a here's a. <laughs> I mean, this is just off. I don't even know what this is. I can't even explain it. Because um, at first it shot low, then moved up higher, and then started to string on me. Um, so I really have no explanation for that. I don't know. I just I <laughs> all I could do is laugh. So I went back to shooting just Russian surplus. I let the barrel cool, and then I did a shot every five seconds or so. You know, I, I fired, um, chambered a new round, took my time, tried to control my breathing, tried to control trigger pull, and I shot two five round groups. These are my last two of the day. Um, and these are not bad at all. Um, you know, this group, for instance, you know, with the five round group and that one flyer, that's just under five and a half. Discount that flyer, you're at two and a half. Discount that guy and say it's a three round group, you're at one and a half. I mean, so if I had stopped at a three round group, that would have been fabulous. Same with this guy. This group fired, um, I started trying to compensate for the stringing. So it still crept higher, but I managed to compensate for going um, from left to right and try, and basically it just strung upwards on me. So again, you know, my first two shots are a half inch. My first three shots are inch and, eh, we'll call it an inch and seven eighths. My first four are inch and three quarter, and then for a five inch group, you're at a shade over three inches. So, for a 1934 rifle, you can see why they would have issued it as a sniper rifle or with the potential to be a sniper rifle. Because just with irons, especially because a sniper is not going to sit there and just keep popping off round after round after round. Um, so if you're shooting, you know, a three three round group that's this size, that's fabulous. So if I could ever find a scope for this rifle, I'm sure it would just be a fabulous. Uh, shooting uh, shooting rifle for long distance, um, but again, that comes down to trying to find a find a good deal on a scope that I've only been able to find for a couple thousand bucks. Um, so that's the potential accuracy. We'll say now your mileage may vary. Chances are more common you're going to see five six inch groups with these rifles um, at 100 yards, which is very respectable, especially from these very crude iron sights. Um, but again, you know, I went out there, I shot, you know, 20 rounds of mill syrup and a I spent probably three times on one box of this wolf than I did this mill syrup that I shot. And the, I mean, look at the results. So safe to say, I won't buy that ever again. Um, now a couple of the other companies, uh, Seller and Bellet, um, oh, who are the other ones? Um, I'm trying to think of the Serbian-made stuff. They make match-grade stuff. It's supposed to be pretty good, but it's 30 bucks a box. So I'll try some eventually. But anyway, so anyone that says that these are crap rifles, they're cheap, they're junk, they don't shoot, that's not true. Because this was done with a $180 1934-issue um, iron-sided Mosin-Nagon. So very respectable, more than happy with that. So now let's get to, uh, let's talk about some cleaning, because that is what I think a lot of people stumble and what they fear most.